Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And we are about two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Caroline Hyde, Taylor Riggs, Shanali Bassett, counting you down to the closing bell. Here to help you take beyond the bell, as always, with our global simulcast is Carol Massa, Tim Stenovic. We go across audience, TV, radio, YouTube, to dissect a world where economic data collides with politics. And we see Chuck Schumer saying that he believes the climate tax deal will pass before the August recess. So really so much to be digesting on today on what takes this market higher. It's amazing, right? Whether it's Washington or Wall Street or Main Street, there is so much coming at investors at this point. What's going to come at us in just a few minutes, we're talking about Apple earnings as well as Amazon earnings. We just talked with James Chalkmock over at Clockwise Capital. He said if we even see some weakness in that Amazon report and the stock trading lower to him, he already owns Amazon. He said that would be a buying opportunity. Yeah, he said that this week had really showed us the, the companies that emerge as the leaders post-pandemic. And he would put meta platforms in one that actually doesn't, reminding us that you know when a company changes, changes its name this far in, uh, perhaps there's some confusion on what their goal is. But Microsoft and Google, he said, those are going to emerge stronger. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how uh, certain companies emerge after the earnings today with some such pivotal ones coming out. The after hours movement today should be just as interesting as the current movement in the markets setting up for the best two days off a of Fed hike at least since 1980, according to our producer Dan <laughs> Curtis and my favorite boss. Dan, Dan <laughs> hears you. We mentioned Pete, our other favorite producer, so much that Dan weighs in to get a shout out as well. But yeah, a significant rally, Caroline, did that statistic represents when you think about some of the big post move fed moves that have really been largely to the downside today is a reversal of that yeah no second day fade into <laughs> the on the day rally today we're up 1.2 percent 48 although it's almost well 47 points higher as we get settlement as we get the ringing in the bells and the shouting and jubilation we see volumes up significantly on the s p almost 20 percent higher versus your usual average and we see the s p up as I say, about 48 points, 1.2 percent higher. The Nasdaq up 1.1 percent higher. That's 130 points on the upside, and actually volumes higher, but only by about 7 percent. Dow Jones up more than a percentage point, and that had big volumes of about 13 percent higher. And the Russell 2000, not to be left behind, up 1.3 percent. Actually, your outperformer of choice today, Carol. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, those are outperformers. And uh, also those solar stocks, if you take a look at all the alternative energy, again, an outperformer. Caroline, you mentioned uh, the legislation and, and things that are making their way through Washington, and that is certainly having an impact. Yeah, we have to look at the sectors also, what is having an impact the most. Because you're looking at real estate, utilities, communications, and professional services rise almost 3% or more. You had the S&P rising about 1%, but some sectors here getting a really really healthy bid and you do see with traders coming yeah. back into the market with some breath you Tsunami. are seeing a lot of green on the screen. I'm just going to weigh in because Amazon is giving its its numbers and net sales coming in at 121 $2 billion. Now that is a beat versus the 119 just. It's giving us a forecast though of 125 to $130 billion for third quarter net sales. That's actually basically higher than expectations of $126, $127 billion that the street wanted to see. Their operating income coming in strong, $3.3 billion, again ahead of expectations. Online stores, net sales, slightly shy of expectations, about $51 billion. The North American net sales doing well, $74 billion. Physical or net sales. Remember, of course, there's Amazon Go that we have a lot of here in Midtown, $4.7 billion. And the subscription services net sales, $8.7 billion, slightly shy. Overall operating margin that is stronger, 2.7% than the market had seen at 1.65%. But they do talk about unfavorable impact from the dollar, 390 basis points. So 3.9% overall, Taylor. Yeah, I mean, so similar, Caroline, when you think about some of the forecasts, I know that we want to stick with Amazon, but we're also getting Intel earnings as well. And the CEO saying that we must and we will do better, that this quarter has been below the standards that we've set for the company. They're re they are reiterating their year in terms of adjusted free cash flow, but they're looking at now adjusted revenue of just 65 to 68 billion. Uh, previously, these estimates were $76 billion. So really seeing a big slowdown here, Carol, when it comes from Intel 
as we take a look at some chip makers outside of the world of Amazon. Yeah, and it's really playing out on that Intel share price here in the aftermarket, down more than 5% as we speak. But going in the other direction, let's go back to the big one also. Amazon now up about 7.6%. And we did see three-quarter net sales, so it's talking about the outlook, 125 to $130 billion. So it's bumping up some of the estimates that are out there on the street. The overall estimate, according to Bloomberg, is $126.97 billion for the third quarter. So that, to me, Tim, says pretty strong consumption mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, what consumers might be doing at Amazon. Yeah, some interesting commentary coming from Amazon CEO Andy Jassy in the press release. He says that, quote, despite continued inflationary pressures in fuel, energy, and transportation costs, we are making progress on the more controllable costs we referenced last quarter, particularly improving the productivity of our fulfillment network. He continued by saying that we're also seeing revenue accelerate as we continue to make Prime even better for members, both investing in faster shipping speed and adding unique benefits such as free delivery for Grubhub for a year and more. Remember, they announced uh, just a few months ago that the prime price would go up here in the U.S. and in Europe. All right, that third quarter revenue really kicking up shares of Amazon higher in the after hours, now up about 8.7%. Let's go to our Poonam Goyal of our Bloomberg Intelligence team. She's a senior industry analyst covering retail. So, Poonam, you were worried about inflation and pressures on Amazon. This looks like a pretty good report. It actually is a very good report. In fact, you know, we were worried about inflation as Amazon had said that there would be an additional $4 billion in cost for the second quarter. But we were not worried about what we saw earlier this week with Walmart taking down guidance as we had thought that Amazon has a different customer base. Amazon doesn't target the low income consumer. So we didn't think Walmart's woes would bleed into Amazon. And that's exactly what we saw today. Uh, sales are better. The guidance is actually really good for the mid-teen sales increase next quarter. Part of that is driven by the prime day shift, but it also shows that the customer is spending where they find value and convenience and speed. Talk to us about how they're managing their own costs, because we did hear from a commentary, and we'll get more of it on the call from Andy Jassy, saying, look, despite these headwinds of inflation and indeed a, a, a concerned consumer, they are managed to control their own costs. How are they doing that? Well, part of that is because they have their own delivery network, right? So they can they can tailor those costs. They can use computers and systems to better align delivery methods and really help bring those costs down. That said, we don't have the full details yet, and we hope to get them all on the call later today about how much of that $6 billion in incremental cost, of which $4 billion was expected in 2Q, how much of that will be um, persistent in the back half of the year, or have they gone through most or half of it? I'm really interested in some of the other things that Amazon is doing here. You're seeing uh, AWS net sales also beat analyst expectations here. You're seeing Andy Jassy's first quote really talk a lot about some of these other things that they're doing. Thursday night football, delivery from Grubhub. This is rare in this kind of environment to see CEOs speak about a little bit more moonshot projects here. So how much do we expect Amazon to really grow and expand uh, given all of these other pressures that they face and are shaking off? Yeah, I think, you know, the misconception that Amazon is mature across any of its uh, any of its businesses is incorrect. Amazon has plenty of opportunity to grow its online business as well as AWS advertising and media. The recent news that we saw on Amazon, whether it was through Grubhub or even in healthcare, just shows that there's so much opportunity ahead for Amazon. They're just tapping the surface. And when they increase that prime membership fee, which they did earlier this year, People are still sticking with it just because of all the value that they get with the Prime membership fee. Hey, Poonam, how come such a beat when it comes to operating margin here? Estimates for one were for 1.65 percent. It came in at 2.7 percent. Where is Amazon able to control these costs in an inflationary environment? You know, I'm, I'm very interested in hearing what they say about where they actually control those costs. My guess would be AWS definitely helped contribute to some of that. But also, perhaps it might be on the transportation front where they do have their own delivery network. Um, but we're waiting to hear just as you are. We don't have the detail there. But it looks like um, they may not have um, exhausted all their cost savings earlier and they found some extra. Does that continue when they're looking at third quarter operating income that could be flat? And I'm curious if this is an investor base that is prepared to maybe see lower profits, to go back to maybe the original company that we knew, a heavy investment in their own business uh, instead of maybe returning some of that to shareholders. Is that sort of an investor base that is prepared for, for that pivot? Do you see that? 
I think I think Amazon should continue to and will continue to invest in the business because keep in mind many of their businesses are still very young, whether that's AWS, whether that's advertising, whether that's media, or even early investments into grocery and pharmacy, which are really nascent when you think about their online penetration. So there will be a lot more investments going forward. That said, on the prof on the profitability part, if their sales grow in the mid-teens next quarter, that also provides them with leverage, right? Um, it's much higher than what we saw in the second quarter. So you should see profits expand over time. And when I say over time, it's the long run, right? Right now, Amazon is still investing, but they do have very lucrative, very high margin businesses that are still young in nature. In fact, AWS alone, we think margins could at some point reach 40%. And that contributes to more than two thirds of their operating profit. We're talking with Poonam Goyal of our Bloomberg Intelligence team. She follows retail, she follows Amazon. Let's just remind everybody that Amazon shares are up almost 12% here in the aftermarket. And in particular, that's because the company came out and said it's third quarter net sales. The forecast for the third quarter, 125 to 130 billion. The estimate out there is 126.97. So they're bumping that up. All right, so you're sitting down with the executives. I always like to ask these kinds of questions of you, Poonam. What do you ask the company? Because it does feel like they are doing really, really well managing the business and also exploring into new businesses? Yeah, you know, the one question that's on top of my mind right now is the excess capacity that they built and where we are on that. How long will it take to fill into that capacity or maybe lease it out? Because that is still a concern and they are building more warehouses as we speak. I saw something come across the newswire earlier where, you know, they're building bigger centers in key cities. So where is all this capacity actually going? Poonam Goyal, of course, our senior retail analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Really appreciate it as you're taking a look at Amazon. Shares are up about 12% after hour. We take the reverse of that, Intel off about 9, 10% or so in post-market. And some really interesting comments. Of course, the numbers, and I'll uh, get through these here. The second quarter adjusted revenue, 15.3 billion. Estimates for 17.9, so really missing estimates by almost 3 billion or so. You have a full year adjusted revenue as well, guiding way lower, 65 to 68 billion. Previously had seen estimates of about $76 billion. So you do have the CEO, Pat Gelsinger, coming out and saying that we must, we will do better, that we are looking for our free cash flow guidance to be reiterated, but really talking about accelerating their deployment of a smart capital strategy, a market at least for now that is not buying it, um, Given some of the numbers, the third quarter, again, adjusted EPS on the bottom line, about half of the expectations, 35 cents versus estimates of 82 cents. Let's dig through all of the different numbers and the comments we're getting from the CEO and bring in Mandeep Singh, senior technology analyst here for Bloomberg Intelligence. And uh, Mandeep, curious what you think about these numbers. Well, when a company comes out and revises its guidance downward by 15%, we're talking about top line here. You look at their Q1 print, they guided to 76 billion, and now they're talking about 65 to 68. So clearly a lot has gone wrong over the course of the last three months, and it just puts into question the credibility of this new management. Mm. You know, what changed so much that they had to guide down by 15% and on a gross margin and operating margin, they came down almost 10 percentage points below what they guided to. I mean, this is a clunker of a quarter. I, I can't find uh, any other wow. word to describe it, yeah. but uh, this is as bad as it gets for Intel. As bad as it gets, a clunker of a quarter, Mandeep. I want to go back to what uh, Pat Gelsinger said in the press release. The quarter results were below the standards we have set for the company and our shareholders. We must and will do better. I want to point out this part, though. He said the sudden and rapid decline in economic activity was the largest driver, but the shortfall also reflects our own ex execution issues. Given what we know about... Uh, what the other chip companies have said thus far, we've learned about them. What are the economic issues that, that he's describing here? Because it's the execution is certainly part of it, and he admits that, but the, the macroeconomic environment is a big part of that. So how should we read into these earnings to get an understanding of the global economy right now? I mean, Tim, Qualcomm reported last night, they grew 37%, guided to 22% growth, and granted, Qualcomm is more exposed to smartphones and 5G, but they also diversified their exposure to automotive, high-performance computing, hyperscale cloud. Intel talked about all these things in their analyst day, uh, you know, a couple of months back, and that's what they said they were pivoting to. So what changed so much that suddenly they have to guide down by 15% and, and they lost all the pricing power. I mean, look at the gross margin compression here. Yeah. 
they're really taking a hit on their pricing. So I don't think anything can you know, justify the kind of uh, guidance that they have taken down here. And to me, this is, yes, uh, execution issues, but also Intel is losing share. And uh, they're losing share to AMD, to NVIDIA, to Qualcomm and to TSMC on the foundry side. And talk about the foundry side, because today we do understand the CHIPS Act has gone to, through. $52 billion is something that Pat Gelsinger was going to be using the money for, digging in, in Ohio, new fabs. But is that the right tactic right now, Mandy? Well, so the thing about building new fabs is it's a multi-year investment. Yes, I think if when a government gets involved and supports the, an industry, it's a good thing. I think overall it's a good thing for all the semiconductor makers here. The problem is setting up a fab, getting it up and running, you know, having the production going will take four or five years. And a lot can transpire between now and then. And all the fabless companies that are relying on TSMC for the latest notes, they will take share here. AMD will take share because they're using TSMC's five nanometer and their chips are much better right now than what Intel has on the market. Let's remind everybody, Intel shares are down 8.4% in the after hours. I can't get away from the CEO saying we must and will do better. All right, so Mandeep, does this company need to be worried about an activist investor saying, yeah, you do need to do better and we need new management? Well, so clearly, I think this uh, puts into question the credibility of the management. And look, there are no easy fixes here. The good thing is government is behind Intel and uh, the entire, you know, uh, U.S. chip industry. So that is a positive. The question is, how can they pivot to the right areas? They talked about that uh, in their analyst day, you know, getting into GPUs and getting into more system on a chip, uh, like moving, pivoting away from their core CPUs that execution isn't showing. So a lot has to show up in execution over the course of the next few quarters. A big thank you to Mandeep Singh, Senior Technology Analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, Caroline, I know you got your eye on a couple of other companies, uh, Roku among them, slumping uh, more than 20% in the after hours yeah, as there's uh, a slowdown hitting results. Great function on the Bloomberg most, and you can see what are the biggest movers after hours. And it, Roku caught my eye because the volume was significant as well. The video streaming platform, we know it, and they're talking about a slowdown in TV advertised spend that is hitting them overall. Therefore, we got third quarter revenue forecast that was below the analyst expectations. They were losing on the second quarter in terms of missing estimates, really. They see a net revenue of 700 million and the market have wanted to see more than 900 million for their net revenue overall. The EBITDA loss they see in an adjusted basis is 75 million. The estimate had been for a profit of 25 million in the third quarter. Gross profit coming at 325. This is a company that on an earnings per share basis is posting 82 cents in the second quarter. And at least that, you know, the market had seen some sort of loss there, but really net revenues not growing as much as had been hoped for. And I think this speaks once again to where companies are going to be spending their marketing dollars not on Roku for the time being. We saw the weakness in Meta, and indeed it's interesting where others has been hit overall. We want to do all of these earnings, really, and dig in a little bit more to the world of Amazon and, and Intel as well with Ted Mortonson, who's with us, technology strategist at Baird. Ted, go back to the juggernauts here, because Amazon is significantly flying after hours, Intel pulling back after hours. What stood out for you in terms of these earnings after the bell? Well, I think you, you can see that uh, Amazon's got tremendous scale. And I think also, um, if you uh, look at that scale and how management is kind of readjusting the infrastructure from an OPEX standpoint, uh, these re results are definitely better than feared, uh, post the Shopify uh, print earlier in the, in the week, as well as uh, the Walmart uh, data. So uh, if you look at the results on Amazon, um, I think North America looks a lot better. Um, we were at 119, uh, 119 billion. They actually obviously did better. Operating margin came in better than feared, and the guide is within expectations. The other thing is, if you look at their model, they have two big op margin drivers. One is their advertising business that looks solid. Uh, they don't break out the oper operating margin contribution, but it is meaningful. And then AWS, if you go back to the Microsoft prints as well as the Google mm -hmm. prints, um, if you look at Microsoft, they grew uh, AWS almost 46%, um, and Google grew uh, GCP about 36%. 
Uh, AWS is slightly above where the street was, at least for that expectations. They're the number one player with tremendous operating leverage versus other players at around 35%. So um, yeah, they're operating in a very difficult consumer environment, but um, uh, managing through it pretty effectively. From operating environment to execution here, you're looking at that steep drop off in Intel aftermarket after reporting, and they do respond to the challenging business environment, but they also say they just were not executing. So to what extent, uh, are, is this a single stock story now? If the managers are not able to rake in as much top line as they can here, what kind of predicament mm -hmm. are they into for the rest of the year? Well, they've, they've had tremendous share losses on the server side just because AMD has a better design. Uh, the other thing I think is uh, if you look at the consumer uh, PC market, um, that, that end market has definitely decelerated the last six months. And Intel derives around 50% of their revenues from that, that compute area. And then in the data center, they just are, quite frankly, just not positioned where AMD is. And AMD continues to take some massive share. I think Pat is still trying to catch up from an engineering standpoint. Uh, if you look at TSM at the five and seven nanometer nodes, they're operating essentially on uh, all cylinders. Intel's trying to catch up on a node generation, uh, and that really hamstrings them uh, on some of the next generation server uh, infrastructure chips that they have that that have been pushed like Sapphire Rapids. So. Um, all around, they're just not executing, and um, I think the magnitude of the the, the uh, miss is much greater than the street um, was looking for. Now, with that said, mm -hmm. there are some people looking at Intel as a national asset now, uh, post the Chip Act, and um, that's mm -hmm. the only saving grace really uh, in the next two, couple quarters for the company. I am curious in your coverage universe, what do you notice about companies like Amazon who? are just setting the standards, setting themselves apart from everyone else? Is it their pricing power? Is it the ability to invest in themselves to get two-day shipping? What is it that that company is doing that sets them apart? Well, if you look at Amazon, their the roots come from AWS, right? And if you look at all of the AI and the machine learning that they have embedded across the organization, uh, whether it be automation in their warehouses versus people, that's where they're pushing. They have tremendous operating margin leverage. Um, and I think if you look forward, at some point, uh, all of this investment in fulfillment and all of that billion dollar um, investment in COVID that will hopefully disappear at one point. And then if you get a, a more of a, uh, a moderated inflation area. Last quarter, um, inflation cost uh, the company a couple billion dollars. So if you look out further and it, look at their scale, the, the operating ledger of the company is very, very powerful. Now, who can compete with Amazon at this point? They've created this massive infrastructure that is um, extremely scalable when rates were basically zero mm. and the capital markets were open. Um, that advantage is only going to multiply from almost a monopolistic leverage standpoint for anybody that's uh, trying to compete with them. Hey, Ted, I want to go back to something you said about Amazon and advertising and get an understanding from you about how Amazon is positioned in an environment where marketers are pulling back. I mean, we saw what happened with Snap. We saw what happened with Meta Platforms. Certainly Alphabet, a different story when it comes to advertising. But where is Amazon positioned right now, given that it operates in kind of this different space and perhaps the changes that iOS, that Apple made to its iOS ecosystem, don't hit it as hard? That's a great question. I think as, as you look at how um, they've structured their advertising, they're almost captive to their own ecostructure on, on e-commerce. So are they really affected by IDFA? No. I mean, they can look at their entire uh, consumer base and um, use AI and machine learning to source advertising. Uh, this is an advantage not only for Google, Amazon, even Apple as they roll out their advertising. Um, the, the companies that are having trouble, uh, obviously Pinterest or a Snap or a Meta, didn't have that captive um, uh, data stream mm. uh, from their own networks. And I think this is a big advantage for Amazon going forward as they leverage their machine learning and, and AI capabilities into that core commerce engine. 
um, they're they're going to be a, a pretty powerful player in advertising. It's uh, it's now becoming a meaningful part of revenue and operating margin. They don't break the uh, operating margin contribution, but it's definitely a driver. All right, going to leave it on that note. Ted, thanks so much. We really appreciate all your input. Ted Mortensen, he's okay. tech strategist at Bayer, joining us there from Milwaukee. Just to rehash, folks, Amazon rallying big time, up about 12% in the after hours with an upbeat third quarter revenue forecast. Intel going in the other direction. We're seeing it sell off about 11% here in the after hours. It talks down its third quarter adjusted revenue looking forward. And then you've got Roku down almost 27% in the after hours. So some big disappointment in terms of that company's uh, third quarter outlook as well as uh, its second quarter numbers. So let's also look forward to Apple, which should be crossing in just a few minutes. Julie Ask is with us. She's vice president and principal analyst of consumer tech over at Forrester. She joins us on the phone from San Francisco and actually uh, on the camera as well. So, Julie, a lot of tech earnings, yes. a lot of big names that are very important, not only to the financial markets, but really to the overall economy and some of the big macro issues of our time. What's front and center for you for Apple when it reports? So I think, well, first, thank you for having me. So I think we'll see what happens. I think with like with a lot of companies selling to consumers, they face a lot of headwinds. There's a lot of consumer uncertainty. We may be facing a recession. There's increasing interest rates. Uh, there's supply chain issues. So I think there's a lot of headwinds all the way around. I think one of the things we always think about, though, when we look at Apple, is they do have a more affluent customer base than most brands do. If you look at the mean household income of, let's say, an Android smartphone owner, it's about uh, closer to $70,000 in the United States um, versus about 88000 for Apple. Um, so it's, you know, like 35% of Apple smartphone owners you know, have a household income of more than $100,000 a year. Uh, so Apple's got some things that uh, play in its favor, even if we see a, a downturn here in the economy. What about the ecosystem here, Julian, when it comes to switching costs? Because when somebody, people don't just switch between iPhones and Android phones because they create, you know, this network when it comes to their own personal devices. So I I'm wondering how essential these Apple devices are in an environment where people are paying more for gas, they're paying more for food. Are they going to pull back on spending on that premium device? Are they going to switch down to an Android device? Or is Apple's ecosystem so powerful that it becomes like a utility? You know, I think it's a really good point, Paul. And it's, uh, you know, there's a bit of, you know, we'll see. I mean, yes, we likely will see consumers do pull back on some spending. But I think there's a number of things that play in Apple's favor. Uh, when we talk to consumers and survey online consumers in the United States, uh, Apple is the number one consumer electronics device uh, brand that they own. Uh, it's even the case that 18% of consumers we survey only own Apple devices, so they're really locked into that ecosystem that you're describing. Mm -hmm. uh, Apple has also been very smart uh, about creating an ecosystem of services that work you know, very seamlessly across their devices. So if anyone's well positioned to hold on to their consumers during this time, I, th I think it's Apple. Julie, Tim talks to us about sort of the ecosystem of an Apple. I want to go a little bit outside of Apple and more the ecosystem of tech and, and big corporations right now because we are hearing from Chuck Schumer, of course, and majority leader in the Senate, about taxes going up for big companies. Is this a headwind longer term? Do you think a 15% minimum tax rate is going to implicate some of these big tech companies? So it's hard to say. You know, I'm not an economist and I'm not a financial analyst. Um, I think, you know, when we think about corporate taxes, too, I think it's a bit of a headwind. Uh, but then what also comes into play is, you know, creating some parity throughout the world with where companies are headquartered, where they're hiring talent. And so I don't see that necessarily as a short term impact, but it could have a longer term impact, you know, more broadly on how their organization is run. How do you think also more broadly on some of the comments we've heard about dollar strength and the impact that it means on the business and the balance sheet, is that less worrisome? Because they're not talking about the fundamentals of the consumer. They're just talking about things out of their control, a la strong dollar. Yeah, so I think, like I said, it's, uh, it's a little harder for me to comment there just because I said I'm not a financial mm -hmm. analyst. Um, but Apple is always strong. It's got a huge balance. Uh, it's got a large cash base. They've always been very savvy. So while I do believe all of these headwinds will impact all corporations, 
I think from our perspective, you know, Al Apple is a little bit more buffered from that than perhaps some of its competitors. Mm -hmm. How much is the devil in the timing here? You know, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman watches this like a hawk, and he notes that this is typically a slow quarter. There weren't any major new product releases. The developer conference said there would be new uh, MacBook Air models, but they didn't go on sale in June. So what are we looking at to drive sales in this current release? So I'd say I think there's two things to look at. So the first is comparing any quarter to the past two years is really hard. Uh, you know, the pandemic's kind of over. Um, consumers are back to work. They're not at home. So I would expect to see a dip in things like services, the amount of media we're consuming, the amount of devices that we're having at home. You know, so I think that's, you know, certainly that's one element of it. Um, but it's... Uh, you know, Julie, you know, I want to go back to, you know, obviously when we think about the consumer and we've heard this a lot today in terms yeah. of preparation for Apple's results, that they are a higher end consumer and the higher end consumer has been holding up, right? We've seen reports from Walmart. So we're seeing what's happening kind of at the lower end. Uh, and certainly those consumers are getting squeezed big time. Um, yes. In general, if we see a disappointment, what does it tell you then more broadly about our economic outlook here? Yeah, so I, like I said, I think that's hard to say. It's really hard to compare to the to the past two years. I think you know one of the upsides. It's you know that's very specific. I mean, if you keep in mind that almost two thirds of Apple's revenue come from its smartphones, mm -hmm. uh, people do replace smartphones more frequently. Uh, the upgrade cycle is certainly faster than it is for a PC um, and for tablets and some of the other devices. So that also plays in their favor. So, like I said, it's hard for me to predict what they're going to announce in about a half hour, but it's, uh, you know, like I said, it's there are some things that they do that buffer them uh, that other companies don't have in place. All right. Julie Ask, uh, Vice President of Principal Research of Consumer Tech at Forrester, joining us from San Francisco. Julie, thanks so much for taking the time. Hey, let's go back to Amazon and talk a little bit because uh, we just got a couple minutes until Apple comes out. But Amazon shares still up more than 11 percent in the after hours. Second quarter sales topping analyst estimates at 121.2 billion. AWS cloud unit sales of 19.74 billion beating estimates, though operating expenses uh, coming in at 117.9 billion dollars below expectations. So a win there as well. Nasdaq futures rise 1.7 percent as we await to see if the trade carries on through tomorrow. Another though big heavyweight Carolina know that of course as we wrap up Amazon and push forward to Apple as well. We think about not only the market cap of this company but the read on the consumer chips supply chain China you name it. Yeah inflationary headwinds the strength of the consumer and also the strength of the share prices of late. Amazon's move is so notable because it had rallied so hard before this. All of these tech companies had a great July. Let's get to the Apple numbers. They're breaking now. And we are overall seeing, well, an earnings per share number that comes in with sales $82.95 billion and indeed an earnings per share of $1.20. Now, this is a company that's seeing Mac revenue just shy of expectations. Product revenue of $63.36 billion. That's a beat overall. iPad revenue is beating. And we are seeing overall like decent revenue numbers of $83 billion just, just ahead of expectations. And the board has declared a cash dividend of $0.23 cents per share, generating about $23 billion in operating cash flow during the quarter. We've already been hearing from Tim Cook, thanks to our own Emily Chang. Let's get to her, Bloomberg Technology Anger. And Emily, what did Tim Cook say to you about these numbers? Hey there, Caroline. I did just get off the phone with Apple CEO Tim Cook. And, you know, look, he, he, he was optimistic about the demand that they're seeing in the quarter ahead. Just like you said, we're seeing a revenue beat here and we're seeing iPhone demand remain strong, which speaks to what we heard from Qualcomm yesterday, that demand for the high end part of the smartphone business is still strong. He also talked about iPad demand still being strong as well, but that supply constraints really face the iPad and the Mac. And you're seeing that in the numbers. In terms of the macroeconomic factors at play, he didn't uh, suggest that uh, that has had anything to do mm. or any impact on demand except in wearables. My interpretation of that is that, you know, uh, these are more discretionary items and because of inflation, because of consumers feeling under pressure, um, that's not necessarily where they're going to choose to spend their money. Um, he mentioned FX multiple times. It's a theme we've heard from a number of these CEOs from my uh, call with CFO of Alphabet, Ruth Porat earlier in the week that if, uh, you know, in constant currency, Apple would have grown 5% uh, instead of the 2% that we're seeing. Now, this was the key uh, headline in my conversation with him. Uh, in my opinion, he said they do expect revenue to accelerate in the September quarter, despite seeing some softness 
in some areas. We do believe there were some macro headwinds that affected the business in the June quarter, which I already discussed. But despite these headwinds, they're expecting revenue uh, in the quarter, current quarter to accelerate. Hey, Emily, it's Carol here. I'm curious, too. We know, you know, Apple among those companies within the big tech universe that where we've heard things about slowing of hiring and slowing of spending across some of the teams at a various company. We heard it from Apple. Anything on that front? Yes, well, of course, we've got reporting from our own Mark Gurman that Apple plans to slow spending and hiring across some teams next year. I asked Tim Cook about this, uh, and, and he said it this way. He said, we believe in investing in downturns, so we've always done that. They found that's uh, made them stronger on the other side. He said, obviously, we're being deliberate in our decisions of where to invest. So uh, a nod to this uh, plan to slow hiring and spending across some teams next year. But, you know, I would say this is not the same, you know, dire, uh, direness or dire level of warning that we've seen from other companies. For example, uh, Alphabet is slowing, slowing hiring now. Other companies are doing layoffs. Uh, that's not happening at Apple just yet. Emily, I think it's really important that you mention that next year outlook because all over this statement, records still being hit, $23 billion in operating cash flow being highlighted, $28 billion of capital return to shareholders, investing still in long-term growth. So to the extent there is some bad news here, you're seeing beats and the shares pop after hours a bit, to the extent there is bad news that could bleed into the coming quarters that analysts and investors will be looking for, what would that still be? You know, I think there are probably still challenges on, on the supply side, but if you'll remember in the last quarter, Apple said, uh, you can take four to eight billion dollars off the top just because of supply chain issues that we're going to face. He said, actually, that came in lower than the low end of that range, ultimately. And he said, quote, we saw significant improvement in the month of June in China on the supply side and on the demand side. He specifically hmm. referenced uh, the June shopping festival holiday in China, saying they had really strong results there. And as we've reported, uh, they're actually starting a promotion in China tomorrow for a few days across a few different Apple devices, which is it's very rare uh, to see a discount like this on Apple products in China. And I, and I asked him for the reasoning there, and he said, look, there's lots of reasons to do with promotions, but it has zero to do with clearing inventory. So we can take from that uh, what, what you will. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, a generally hmm. up, up, optimistic and upbeat tone from Tim Cook, especially on the supply side, that they have seen significant improvement. Okay, well, good. Let's talk more there and talk more about China, Emily. And, and just to give us an idea of what you learned from Tim Cook uh, about supply challenges in China, because look, China's an incredibly important market to Apple, not just when it comes to sales, but also when it comes to manufacturing of many of these devices. So what do you know about how continued lockdowns have affected sales or continued lockdowns have affected actual supply of these products? What else did we get? I think the word is improvement and yeah. that it was better than they thought it would be, right? They said it would be, you know, they, they could lose potentially four to eight billion dollars because of these issues. In fact, it was less than the four billion that they expected. And, you know, Tim Cook never gives any indication about about what's coming uh, in the quarter and the quarters ahead. Uh, he, he very much wants to talk about uh, the last quarter and the results that they've already seen. But it's definitely more, I, I believe we're, we're hearing a more optimistic tone than we've heard from other CEOs. Not lost on us, Emily, that it's also coming when we're getting the CHIPS bill, a CHIPS Act, about $52 billion of a bill that was sent to the president for his signature. Apple is a company that has tried to build that moat around itself, working on that M1 chip, the M2. How are you thinking about a company that is trying to become more self-sustaining? He did mention the M2, said they're very excited about it, very proud of uh, the impact that it's already having and will continue to have. And I think it is, it's certainly part of Apple's long-term strategy. And, you know, as we know, Tim Cook is the architect of Apple's supply chain. And so uh, he, you know, personally knows how difficult it can be to procure uh, the right supply when you need it and certainly in these times. And so I think building and, and designing its own chips just makes Apple, uh, you know, more independent, more self-sufficient in times of economic downturn. And I think the hope, you know, for some investors, we've seen Apple shares rise um, or outpace their peers like Alphabet mm -hmm. and Microsoft in the current macroeconomic environment. And the hope is that Apple, even though it will be impacted by a downturn, might be more of a safe bet in a downturn.
Really appreciate it. Our very own Emily Chang. Make sure to stay tuned. Catch her coming up in just a few moments time as well for that show Bloomberg Technology. We want to stay with Apple, dig deeper into these numbers with our very own Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Software and IT Services Analyst, Anurag Rana. Anurag, curveball. Why aren't we getting forward guidance? Do we need forward guidance from this company that was paused during COVID? I, we should, but you know, as we heard, there are so, so much of things that still uncertain about the supply chain, about openings in China. But you know, I, I was very um, you know happy to hear the, the comments that came from Emily uh, because I was I went into the quarter a lot more pessimistic than most people because I thought because of the consumer slowdown, because of China, because of Europe, you know, we will not likely to see uh, this kind of a beat that we saw um, at least you know going into next quarter. Of course, Tim Cook talking about macroeconomic headwinds, hurting the third quarter, expecting revenue to accelerate in their fiscal fourth quarter despite some softness. Anurag, where do you think has been firing on all cylinders? Clearly the iPhone has been. It was notable that there wasn't much to be buying in their third quarter, fiscal third quarter, in terms of new products. So are you hopeful for the innovation to come? Yeah, but you know, in the case of Apple, a lot depends on the iPhone cycle, and largely because, as, as as your guest you know previously alluded, it is the biggest portion of revenue for them. So the smaller smaller products really don't move the needle as much. It's really at what pace do people upgrade their iPhones, and you know, it's going to be fun because in the next quarter we're going to see a brand new version come out, and uh, that's going that's going to you know set set them up for a nice holiday season too, assuming that you know the macroeconomic conditions globally don't get worsened from here. Hey, you know, Anurag, what is the most surprising part of Apple's report here? Uh, to me, the comments about supply chain, because I really was going into the quarter thinking that supply chain actually worsened during the quarter because of COVID restrictions in China and the parts weren't available or the assembly wasn't available. That was that was my thought process going in. But, you know, based on Emily's comments, it looks like things eased up a little bit. Now, that to me is the number one positive announcement uh, that came out of this release. Are there also some signs here that some of the headwinds that they had faced are now really starting to uh, come down? You have Tim Cook saying that he expects revenue to accelerate in the fourth quarter despite some softness, he says. So have they turned a corner in many ways? So the way I think about it is, you know, I, we were expecting, uh, you know, acceleration in the, in, in the next quarter on a constant currency basis. We were expecting a, a headwind because of currency. But, uh, you know, but, but I, I don't see them going into double-digit revenue growth again over here. I think even if the, it is revenue acceleration, it's still going to be single digits. And in fact, it's possible that, you know, services uh, growth may slow down even more uh, going into that uh, the next quarter. But overall, uh, I mean, I can't find that many mistakes at this point, largely because of the supply chain issues. Anurag, how should we think about the iPhone upgrade cycle in a time when consumers are paying so much more for gas and so much yeah. more for groceries? They're not necessarily, you know, in, in my mind, going to switch out of the Apple ecosystem and go to an Android phone. But does it mean they hold on to their iPhone 10 or iPhone 11 for maybe an extra year? Tim, I, I did uh, see your question, you know, previous guest also. But, you know, unlike the other retail world where you can, you know, water down and go to a discount store and buy things, you're not going to give up your phone and go to an Android. And I think the same is case for a Samsung high-end user. You're not going to leave Samsung and go to uh, an Apple phone. But frankly speaking, what happens is the Apple has such a massive install base of iPhone users that let's say, let, let's say that number is closer to 800 million units. Every year, and, and the average life of refresh cycle is about four years. So every year, they're going to sell about 200 units, 200 million units anyway. It's a question of in really good times, they're going to sell a little bit more, and bad times, they're going to sell less. Right. So yes, you can push the you know, cash flow out by a few months, but that doesn't change the fact that whenever you upgrade, you're still going to stick with an iPhone. I don't really like all the comparisons to Androids and Samsung. Some of us still enjoy some Blackberries every now and then as we think about the pivot to the iPhone. But we'll get serious. <laughs> You're the only one, Taylor. And stay serious with you for a moment. We've all Cash pivoted. <laughs> neutrality. <laughs> How do you think about a company generating $23 billion in operating cash flow, the use of cash that comes from that as they try to maintain the cash neutrality? Yeah, I, I, I have made the argument that they should actually buy back a far more shares in this environment when they are depressed because of, uh, you know, the ongoing macro conditions. But, you know, the, the share buyback was in line with what they have done in the last couple of quarters. So not much there. But I really hope 
that they, you know, they, they accelerate that plan because, as you said, they are so far away from that cash neutral uh, position mm -hmm. uh, that they can, you know, they can they, they can easily go another 30, 40 percent without a problem. All right. So, Anurag, based on what we got from Apple, is this a company thinking about a recession? Because here we are when we talk about macro recession, no recession. We got the disappointing GDP based on what we got from Apple. Is this a company that indicates maybe a recession is coming? Now, I have been surprised. I've said there are four amazing business models that you know operate in the United States, and all four of them have reported really spectacular results over the past few days. Um, Apple is a brand that you know envious to any company in, in, from any country. So I, I really think you know I think they've turned a corner over here, but because not because of so much of demand issue, but because of supply chain issues. What about on the services number? Help us read into that, Miss. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it is double digits. It's it is really facing tough comparisons. It is not easy to come up with double digit growth in that area for a very long period of time. We saw some really strong numbers from the pandemic. You know, it's only going to get a little softer from here in our view because you're not downloading as many games. You're not, you know, payment volumes going to go down later. So the way they, I think they're going to expand that is they add more services. They mm. add more, let's say, TV content and other things because. To me, that's really where the investment should go to, and you know, not in a car or anything. But we can talk about that later because mm. this is a very high margin business. These are, you know, gross margins for services business right. is seventy percent. It is, it is, it is truly the right place to be. Pretty remarkable, Anurag Rana. Thank you so much, team leader, technology, Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, breaking down those Apple earnings, and we continue to see Apple shares rallying in the after hours. Pressure on Intel, but Caroline, let's talk about what's going on with S and P 500 mini futures and Nasdaq 100 futures, because folks, they are rallying. Mm, they are. Let's look at the futures market up another two percent when you're looking at the S and P 500 mini. When you're looking at the Nasdaq, 2.2 percent. No wonder when the most valuable tech stock in the world or publicly traded. Apple is trading higher after hours when Amazon is up so much. I mean, put Intel to one side. This really is a story of strength. And as you so rightly said, not really companies talking about a recessionary environment here, Taylor. Well, and we and I want to be careful with my words here. We talked a lot about the K-shaped recovery out of COVID. I'm mm. wondering this quarterly earnings report season feels similar. You have companies like Apple, Amazon, Juggernauts able to get it done, crushing it. The after hours yeah. market shows that, Tim. And then you've other companies, of course, still sort of struggling, whether it be supply chain inventory that we've talked about. There seems to be a big divergence on those who are able to get it done and navigate and those who are not. Yeah, and a really big divergence when it comes to customers, too. Brian Nickel of Chipotle telling us yesterday that they've lost, as they've raised, pr raised prices, they've lost some customers mm -hmm. in the lower end of the income spectrum. Those customers have traded down. Meanwhile, perhaps the iPhone owning customers, yeah. right? The wealth your customers, they are trading down from restaurants to go to Chipotle. So we're seeing this play out on a lot of different levels here. Yeah, but right now we're seeing out play out in the aftermarket and investors are getting ready, maybe potentially for some more rallying uh, into the trade for Friday. All right, guys, we got to run covered so much ground. Apple, Amazon, Intel, Roku. Uh, these are all trading in the after hours following their earnings. That's going to do it. That's a wrap for Beyond the Bell, our extended simulcast on this big earnings uh, Thursday. Do be sure to catch us again, same time, same place on Friday.